All right. Hello and welcome to our second deep talks of the 2020 and 2021 seasons. Um, we so wish we could see you guys in person down at the visitor center in Leed, but we are so excited that you chose to join us for another virtual event. Um, I'm Erin Broberg. I'm a communications specialist at Sanford Underground Research Facility. And I wanna thank you for joining us for Deep Talks Why Dune. Before we get started, I wanna take just a moment to thank our Deep Talks sponsors. We have Crow Peak Brewing Company who provided the door prizes for tonight. Um, we have RCS Construction, Northern Hills Federal Credit Union and Chuck and Jolene Lichtenwolner. Uh, we just really want to thank these people and organizations for their generous gifts and their continuing support of science outreach and education in this region. Uh, before we get started, I um, just want to let you know that tonight's topic is the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or DUNE. DUNE is the world's flagship neutrino experiment, and it's hosted by the Department of Energy's Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. This experiment needs two things, mysterious particles called neutrinos, which scientists can make with their particle accelerators at Fermilab near Chicago. It also needs a huge detector to study those neutrinos, which will be built here at Sanford Underground Research Facility in Leeds, South Dakota. Uh, so we're gonna show you right now a short video to introduce you to this experiment before we introduce our speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and let our team pull that video up. This is Fermilab, a Department of Energy National Laboratory near Chicago. It's the starting place for the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, DUNE, powered by the Long Baseline Neutrino Facility, LBNF. The experiment begins with Fermilab's accelerator complex, which moves protons close to the speed of light. It's all part of an effort by more than a thousand scientists from around the world to figure out how tiny particles called neutrinos work, and what role they play in the evolution of our universe. Neutrinos are the most abundant matter particles in the cosmos but very hard to catch. Trillions stream through you every second without leaving a trace. At LBNF, the beam of protons will smash into a target, creating the most intense beam of neutrinos in the world. Scientists will collect data to measure properties of neutrinos close to the source and again far away. Neutrinos change as they travel, so scientists are sending them straight through 1,300 kilometers of rock toward the dune detectors at the Sanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota. The detectors can also look for the birth of neutron stars and black holes by catching neutrinos from exploding stars. The one and a half kilometer deep detectors will be filled with 70,000 tons of liquid argon, making them the largest neutrino detectors in the world. As neutrinos interact with the cold liquid, they create a shower of other particles and light. Those particle tracks are then picked up by electronics and transmitted as data to the surface. The information will be analyzed by scientists at collaborating institutions in countries around the world. They'll use this data to solve unanswered questions about neutrinos, and maybe even figure out why matter exists. Things like planets, stars, and even you. All right, thanks for sharing that. So this is an incredibly exciting experiment, um, but right now at Sanford Lab, we are currently in the pre-excavation phase of this construction project. So we have a long way to go before the detector is operational, uh, but we're very excited for that to happen. And tonight we get to kind of jump ahead to that part and talk about the research that this experiment will be doing and the big questions that scientists want to answer with Dune. So to help us do that tonight, we have three fantastic speakers, each of whom will give a 15 minute overview of one of the three main science goals of Dune. And that will be followed by a Q&A session. So we would love to hear your questions throughout. Uh, if you're joining us through Zoom, please use the Q&A function to send in some questions. Um, and then if you're watching live on Facebook, we'll also be monitoring those questions too, and then we'll plug them into our Q&A. So throughout, please um, enter all your questions that you have. 
Uh, there's also a chat function. So if you have any technical issues or anything you need some help with, please pop something in the chat and we would love to try and help you. So our first speaker tonight is Dr. Ryan Patterson. Uh, Dr. Ryan Patterson's current research focuses on the neutrino sector of particle physics. Patterson received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the California Institute of Technology, where he currently serves as a professor of physics. He also received a PhD in physics from Princeton University. Patterson currently serves as physics coordinator for the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. And this evening, Dr. Patterson will be speaking about how Dune could help physicists physicists better understand the origin of matter. So, welcome. Hello. Happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Um, I suppose I can uh, begin sharing uh, my visual aids. Let me do that. Um, yeah, so as you saw in the introduction, um, Dune has a number of different physics goals, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a little bit about one of them. And uh, let me hide these meeting controls. Okay. And so this is going to be a story on the biggest sizes in the universe and also the smallest sizes. And so to start, this is a picture that's not too um, unusual, a picture of a galaxy. And galaxies have been studied for a long time by mankind. And we know a lot about them, about the stars that make them up, about how those stars spin around the gravitational pull from all of the stars together, how there's hydrogen and helium and how they interplay and how they make new stars and how stars die. And all of that makes sort of sense within the physics that we understand today. And if you go out a little bit farther, uh, this is a picture that um, is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Picture. And it's a lot of galaxies. And this is uh, an area of the sky um, about the size of a grain of rice held out at arm's length. So an area of the sky much smaller than even the moon has this much richness in it. And so again, there's a lot to study here. There's a lot of data. There's information about all of the light coming, the different colors of light. Um, when I say color, that means not only uh, you know, red versus blue, but also x-rays and radio waves and these sorts of things. And then if you go out a bit further, you have the, what we call the large scale structure of the universe. And so this is a, a it's, it's no longer a picture. It's, it's a little more complicated, but this is showing the distribution of galaxies throughout a portion of the universe that stretches a couple hundred, uh, let me say that differently, I'll use light years, um, stretching uh, about 2 billion light years. And um, with the right telescopes, you can look out and see how the galaxies are distributed. Um, you can see that they're clumped in these sort of patterns and gravity causes that, uh, causes them to sort of clump together. And how distributed or clumpy they are is a very important piece of information about the evolution of the universe. And one final picture I'll show that is even um, one step more abstract is this one, which is uh, a picture of microwave radiation coming toward the Earth from all over the universe. And it's not actually a picture of the microwave radiation. It's a picture of uh, the frequency of that microwave radiation, how, how fast those radio waves, those microwaves are moving uh, relative to an average. And so some spots are a little bit faster and some spots are a little bit slower. And there's a lot of rich data here that mixes all together into this whole story of how the universe started and how it's gotten to where it is today with the galaxies and the planets and us on it. So that story works. If you, all of the physics that underlies it um, up to a point is uh, pretty well understood and it makes all of these very different types of observations and a lot that I haven't tried to show here, things like um, how much helium there is in the universe. Most of it's hydrogen, but there's a lot of helium and exactly how much there is relative to the hydrogen is an important um, measure of how the universe has evolved, for example. 
there are a couple of things about the underlying physics of this very complicated process of the universe coming to be that uh, we don't quite have our heads around yet. Um, one that hits the news quite a bit is called dark matter. So this whole, um, uh, the, the whole physics that describes all of this requires there to be some new type of matter called dark matter. And we don't currently know what that is. A lot of experiments are looking um, very uh, uh, eagerly and very in very sophisticated ways for what this new type of matter might be. There's another piece, which is the story assumes that matter and antimatter, which I will introduce now, behave a little bit differently. So let me say a little bit about antimatter. So electron is um, a, probably the most familiar particle, maybe a photon, if, if, uh, um, if you wanted to have a race between the most familiar particle, those would probably be at the top. Um, so electrons are everywhere, but there are antiparticles called anti-electrons or positron is just another name for them. And they're not everywhere. If they were, they would look just like an electron, except they would have the opposite electrical charge. They would be positive instead of negative. In the very early universe, if the universe didn't have a preference, it would make these equally. And the problem with that is when a particle and its antiparticle partner come into contact with each other, in this case, if the electron and the positron were to drift into each other, either because they're electrically attracted or just by chance, then they would annihilate and turn into radiation. They would uh, no longer exist. And in, in their place would be uh, some form of other stuff coming out. For electrons and positrons are typically photons, very high energy photons. Um, so, so again, not like what would come out of a light bulb, but more like uh, what would come out of a radioactive process. So very high energy, things like gamma rays. Um, and the electron and positron just aren't there anymore. So if in the very early universe, you produced particles and antiparticles equally, then as the universe evolved, they would start annihilating with one another and there wouldn't be anything left. So kind of graphically, one way to Look at that is here, if you had the early universe, and by early universe, I mean fraction of a second uh, after, uh, after the Big Bang. If yellow is matter and red is antimatter and it's all distributed, then after a while, they would annihilate away and it would be nothing left, except we do have something left. So if you look out in the universe, there are galaxies, uh, there are clusters of galaxies, there is all this large scale structure. And so there's a little tiny bit of extra matter. So our underlying understanding of cosmology and of particle physics uh, is okay with this, except we don't have in our model of particle physics enough of this matter versus antimatter difference to explain it. So in our uh, current understanding, all the experimental measurements that have been done so far, matter and antimatter behave almost exactly alike. And they would have been produced almost exactly in equal numbers. I'm saying almost because we do have some very um, uh, esoteric measurements that have been done in, in sophisticated particle physics experiments that have shown a little bit of a difference in how matter and antimatter behave. But it's nowhere near enough to explain the leftovers that you would need to get the universe that we see today. So what's needed is a new source in our understanding of the universe for this matter-antimatter asymmetry. And it may very well be that neutrinos provide that source. Uh, neutrinos can provide it. Uh, our, our, again, our models of particle physics allow for it. But neutrinos are very difficult to work with experimentally. And so it's never been measured. Uh, and so that's one of the things that Dune's trying to do. And so I can tell you a little bit about that now. So neutrinos, uh, as you heard in the introductory video, um, they're everywhere and indeed, um, Trillions of them do pass through you every second. Most of those are coming from the sun. That's our closest, most intense neutrino source. And this is a picture of the sun actually taken with neutrinos. So uh, a neutrino detector in Japan located deep under a mountain uh, could see the neutrinos coming from the sun and could 
reconstruct an image of it using those neutrinos, which is a pretty cool picture. Another source that's very common is cosmic rays. So the Earth is bombarded by particles from outer space, and they smash into the atmosphere and produce a whole spray of other particles that come out of those collisions. And some of those particles that eventually rain down on the Earth are neutrinos. And they're harmless. They happen, they're coming down all the time, along with many other types of particles. This diagram labels some of them. There's a proton, which is coming in. There are particles called pions, particles called muons. None of these matter so much for our story. But neutrinos do come down, and experiments do study those. Nuclear reactors are also a, a pretty copious source of neutrinos, if you're close to them. Um, again, neutrinos are, are so uh, uh, weak in how much they interact with matter that you would never know. You need very sophisticated equipment to be able to even detect them coming out. But they are there and they're used to, to study neutrinos. And then finally, we can make neutrinos with particle accelerators like you saw in the introductory video. And this is indeed a, a picture of Fermilab where the dune neutrinos will come from. So this is the layout so the, um, the source of the neutrinos at Fermilab is outside of Chicago, and then 1,300 kilometers west of there is the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And uh, we need both a very intense beam of neutrinos and a very large detector. The, the largeness of the detector is, is sort of, there's two reasons. One is because neutrinos don't interact much, they mostly are just gonna pass right through the detector. And so the more detector you have, the more chance you have of catching one here and there. The other reason is that the further away you go, the more the, the beam of neutrinos has spread out. And so right up close to the beam, uh, if, if you put a detector um, just you know a mile away instead of 1300 kilometers away, then it wouldn't need to be very big to get lots and lots of interactions. And we do, in fact, have a detector right close to the source of the beam to measure it and sort of see what we start with before they, the neutrinos go on their way. So when we say we make neutrinos, uh, and, and throughout here I've been using neutrino just as a single type of particle, there are actually three different types of neutrinos. And for this story, we care about two of them. We care about one that uh, so let me let me tell you about these letters here. So these are Greek letters mostly. Uh, the Greek letter nu um, is the, this sort of V looking thing. It's the Greek letter for N. And that's what we use as a symbol for neutrino. And so here we have a uh, neutrino that has a little tag on it there, which is another Greek letter called a mu. And so the muon type neutrino, which is one of the types, is called that because when that neutrino does occasionally interact, it produces a particle called a muon. And that's one of the things we look for in the detector. But there's another type, which is tagged with a little e, and that's an electron type neutrino. And so when that neutrino interacts, it will be able to produce an electron. And so they are different particles. There are three different types of these. But uh, what was discovered really only in the past couple of decades is that neutrinos can change between these types. So when you make a neutrino of one type, if you detect it right away, it's always, you're always gonna see it as that same type. But if you let it travel for a while, in this case, 1300 kilometers or so, there is a chance that it will transform along the way into a different type. And uh, these are two of the types, and there's a third type called a tau neutrino that uh, it, won't, it won't come up again. So we make at Fermilab a lot of muon neutrinos, and then in South Dakota, we will look for any small amount of them that have turned into electron neutrinos. Uh, I'll tell you why that's an interesting thing to look for in a second. So uh, here is a little bit about the detectors themselves. So they, uh, they are filled with liquid argon. I, th I think the video mentioned that. So this is, so argon gas is in the atmosphere at a very low rate, and you can pull it out with refrigerator technology. And uh, if you get it cold enough, then you can liquefy it and fill up a giant tank of it. And so it needs to be very cold, 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And eventually we need 70,000 tons of it to fill the detectors in South Dakota. This picture here is showing you a small version. I say small because it's actually quite large. This, this little stick figure for scale uh, gives you a sense of how large this is. And the full dune detector will be twice as high, four times as wide, 
uh, about six times as long, and there will be four of them. So it's it's massive. If you were to take the same volume and put it on a football field, it would be three stories tall of total volume of liquid argon. The, the way these detectors work is that, so this one doesn't have the liquid argon in it right now because there's someone taking a picture in there. But the idea is that particles that are produced by the neutrino interactions inside the argons, the neutrino comes in, it smacks into an argon atom, and it produces other things like the muon, for example, for the muon neutrino, but also other debris that gets knocked out of the argon that it hit. And when it does so, it, it frees up some electrons from the argon atoms. So atoms have protons and neutrons at their core and electrons around them, and you can kick some of those electrons off. And then those electrons are collected uh, by lots of wires that are on the side of the detector. And so that copper color that you see is actually thousands of individual wires that will pick up the electrons that are produced within the volume of the argon. And then we can read out those electrons and that gives us a picture of the particle tracks, the particle paths within the, the argon itself. And this is the sort of picture that you get. Uh, this, is, this is a simulated picture because the detector is not built yet, but uh, we have prototype detectors, which that, like the one I just showed you, um, where we've had um, smaller images of, of events taken. So here a neutrino comes in from the left and, and interacts at that leftmost point where lots of stuff seems to be connected and it produces a muon and the muon streams all the way across this picture. It's several meters long and then you can see some of the other debris. And so we have uh, computer algorithms that we designed to look at these, figure out what happened, what type of neutrino it must have been. And so we're gonna look for the needle in the haystack of these electron neutrinos interacting inside a, a, a bunch of interactions where it was a muon neutrino. So the reason we're doing this, as I said, we'll make muon neutrinos and we will look for electron neutrinos. What I didn't mention before is that with this neutrino beam, we can also make anti-neutrinos. And the, the way we um, kind of notate antiparticles is with a little bar over the symbol. So that's why on the right, the, the Greek letter nu has a little bar over it to, to indicate that it's an antineutrino. So we can make antineutrinos and we can look for those changing into electron. We can make muon antineutrinos and look for them turning into electron antineutrinos. And the key is to compare those. So uh, the, the key principle of this measurement is that if neutrinos are related to this universal matter antimatter asymmetry that we see out, out when we look out, then this particular process is a little window into that difference. That this rate of muon neutrinos changing into their cousin, the electron neutrino, would be slightly different for neutrinos than it would be for antineutrinos. So if we can measure these two transitions very precisely and compare them, then we can perhaps learn if neutrinos are in fact why the universe has anything in it at all. And if they play a role in the, that very early universe having a slight imbalance to give us the galaxies and, and everything else that we see today. So with that, I think I will uh, hand it off to your next speaker. I think I'm, I'm muted. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much, Ryan. I know that is a huge topic to cover in 15 minutes and you did an excellent job. Um, if you sparked some of our uh, attendees curiosity and want to learn more about that, please put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Kate Schulberg. Uh, she is a Canadian and American neutrino physicist whose research has included experimental studies of neutrino oscillation and the detection of supernovae. She is an arts and sciences distinguished professor of physics and Bass fellow at Duke University. Schulberg is a researcher in the Super, Super Kamiokande and T2K collaborations, the Dune collaboration, and is a spokesperson of the coherent experiments at the Spallation Neutron Source of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She is also one of the founders of the Supernova Early Warning System. And tonight, Dr. Schulberg will discuss what neutrinos can tell us about exploding stars and the formation of neutron stars and black holes. So thank you for being with us, Kate. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thanks everybody for attending. Let me try to share my screen here. It's this one. Go to full screen. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna tell you, you saw a little bit of, in that video, I'm gonna tell you about how we actually can see a star explode from deep underground with Dune. Um, and uh, supernova, you've probably heard of supernova. Supernova is basically a, a star blowing itself up to smithereens. They are enormously luminous objects. Um, in fact, in light, in photons, uh, for a while they can actually be as luminous as an entire galaxy. You saw in Ryan's talks and pictures of galaxies, those have 100 million stars in them. And um, it might not be as luminous as a big galaxy, but it could be as luminous as a small galaxy. So they're really, really super, super bright events. And some of the supernovae, there's actually different ways they can happen, but one of the main ways is what's called a core collapse supernova. And the model for that, so what we think is happening there, is that a star, after it has burned up its nuclear fuel, can no longer hold itself up against gravity. It's normally the, the energy from the nuclear burning in the star that is holding its star up. And when that can no longer uh, hold the star up, basically it collapses. Um, and um, when that collapse scrunches down, it rebounds and can blow up the star. And what you also get is what's called a compact remnant. That is when a lot the large fraction of the mass of the star will fall back down and will scrunch down. It will make a really super, super um, dense uh, ash remaining object. That can be either something called a neutron star, which is um, a, a, uh, um, a, a very, uh, very dense matter, or it can be a black hole. You've all heard of a black hole. That's an object that's so dense that not even light can escape. And in either case, when it forms one of these remnants, what you get is this enormous burst of neutrinos, much, much brighter neutrinos than the light itself. And for about 10 seconds, it's really a short period of time. Um, and what I, I'll tell you about how we, um, how those neutrinos are, are made and, and how we see them. I'll say a little bit more about the remnants and these are exotic, um, really fascinating objects. Um, a neutron star is when basically it's the entire mass of the sun, basically uh, an object, the matter in an object the size of a sun is compressed to something the size of a city. Now, and this is just a, a really cool visualization for, you know, what's the size of a city. Imagine the entire mass of the sun in that, in that big black object uh, uh, hovering, over, hovering over a city. So it's really ultra dense um, exotic matter. And then of course there's a black hole um, where it's, it's um, if, if in fact there's a, a a neutron star greater than about three times the, the mass of the sun, it will further scrunch down until it actually becomes a black hole. And in fact, we could see that by looking at the neutrinos that are coming out of this event. And, and what would happen is that the neutrinos would be very, very bright. And then suddenly, bam, they would cut off very sharply. And we could see that very clearly in the neutrinos that come out. We could actually see not only the neutron star being born from the flash of neutrinos, but we could also see the resulting final neutron star burst if birth if, if one is actually being formed by the fact that the neutrinos would suddenly cut off. And so that would be really super exciting. And I, I just have to mention, looking at the neutrinos, if you're an astrophysicist and you're looking at uh, objects in the sky, um, if you are doing that using neutrinos, if you're actually trying to see uh, um, astrophysical events with neutrinos instead of light, instead of photons or radio waves or whatever, there are huge advantages and huge disadvantages. And so this picture here, if you're wondering what that, what that is, that's the result of doing a Google search for ghosts escaping. And so ghosts are, um, uh, neutrinos are often uh, said to be like ghosts because they just go right through things almost all the time. They interact very rarely, very weakly. And so they're really kind of ghostly. Um, and that's true for astrophysical objects. The ghosts will escape from, um, from from uh, huge luminous events like a supernova, and what what the advantage of them, why you love them if you're an astrophysicist, is that they bring information from very deep inside, from where the photons are trapped. So right in the regions where a neutron star is being formed, where a black hole is, is being born, you can actually kind of see all the way inside there. Uh, you get information from the neutrinos that come out. But the flip side of that is neutrinos interact so rarely that you need huge detectors, really heroic um, efforts to actually see them. Because you, you, um, if you want to actually stop a neutrino, you need an enormous detector. 
And just to now say a few words about why do we get this huge burst of neutrinos from a, a stellar collapse um, and, and subsequent explosion? It's really the neutrinos are actually coming out before the explosion. They're really coming out right after the collapse. And just a way to think about that, if you have a falling object, there's energy that is coming from gravity that then turns into noise. It turns into possibly light in some cases, but you know, there's basically energies that will damage something if you have a, a um, a, a, a piano falling, you, you, get, you get a big, a big mess uh, when, it, when it hits the ground. It's the same thing for a falling star. It's falling inward on each other. And that energy from gravity has to go somewhere. And the reason it leaves via neutrinos is that the neutrinos can actually escape the debris of the star. And because they interact so weakly, they can just zoom right out and they take all the energy away before the rest of it can escape. And so that's why you get this huge, huge burst of neutrinos. It's more than a hundred times the photons um, when you have a, a stellar collapse. So this is really, um, really amazing. It's, it's actually more than 99% of that energy of the collapse of the star that um, leaves the, the vicinity, the neutrinos make off of that energy within only about 10 seconds. And so it's this really enormously bright flash of neutrinos that we want to try to see. I can mention also that there's a, a huge area of astrophysics which is involved in trying to understand in detail how does that explosion happen after the star falls and it scrunches down and then it bounces back. Exactly how does that explosion happen is something that's very complicated. There's shock waves, there's all kinds of all kinds of crazy things happening. And trying to understand how the explosion happens is something that is still not completely understood. But the neutrinos are there, and the neutrinos are actually even possibly driving that explosion. And we have to understand the neutrinos in order to understand how the stars blow up at all. Uh, at all. And there's a lot of you know, supercomputer studies uh, trying to understand this. And this is also the properties the neutrinos feed into that. So this happens only rarely in our galaxy locally. So if you take the Milky Way galaxy, we're likely to have a core collapse maybe only every few decades. And of course, that's, that's, um, that's a long time between exciting uh, core collapse supernovae. However, um, it's, it's, uh, what that means is that it's especially important to get all the information. There has been one since neutrino detectors have been running. And this was in 1987. This is a famous supernova 1987A, which actually wasn't in our galaxy. It was in a little mini galaxy, which is outside of our own galaxy. And there were about two dozen neutrinos that were actually seen that actually interacted in underground detectors made of water that happened at that time. And there hasn't been a core collapse since. And we're hoping for one very soon. We expect to have one about every 30 years or so. Here's a picture of our, our, our Milky Way galaxies right here. Um, and there's also the Andromeda galaxy over here. You can see that in the sky uh, with your naked eye. This LMC is where 87A happened. And in this region, in that circle, that sphere, we expect about one core collapse every 30 years. So that's something we can certainly plan for for building detectors like Dune, which are gonna last for, uh, run for decades. So here's Dune, you heard about that already, um, a liquid argon detector and uh, underground, about a, um, one and a half kilometers underground. Um, and when a supernova blows up, you saw that beautiful neutrino um, interaction picture that Ryan showed. That is a, a relatively large event. That is the size of it is maybe meters. Supernova events are actually much cuter and smaller. They may be only 10 centimeters in size. Um, and, and you get lots of little kind of little uh, little worms and little blips. They're much, they're much more subtle events, but you get lots of them and you get them all within about 10 seconds. The whole detector, you get a whole burst of these little, little stubs and little, little sparkles happening in the detector. You might ask why underground? And the reason for that is that there's cosmic rays constantly raining down on the surface of the earth and, and they're, they're harmless. They go right through you. If you hold your hand out, um, can't really see on this, you get about, on the surface, you get about one cosmic ray per, per second or so going through your hand. Uh, of course, if you have a big detector on the surface, that would be, you know, huge numbers of particles going through your detector. Um, and because you're looking for relatively rare events, you want to be shielded. You want to have some rock over your head that's going to uh, filter out those cosmic rays. So that's why you want to be underground. And actually, the the Sanford Lab site is really it's really fantastic uh, in terms of getting a really quiet um, situation so that you could easily see a burst of neutrinos. 
Okay, and and so Dune is not the only detector that's sensitive to supernova neutrinos, or, and won't you know won't be even it won't be when it's built. And this is actually the situation worldwide today um, of neutrinos that would see a burst of supernova neutrinos if it happened right now. You can see there's actually a whole bunch of different experiments around the world. There's one at the South Pole. There's a couple in Japan. There's one in China. There's two in Italy. Um, one in Canada here, and these detectors would all see a burst of events. They're, none of these are made of liquid argon. They're made of either a hydrocarbon or lead or, um, uh, or water. So they're different materials. They're, they're quite different detectors. And I just want to say the reason Dune is really special for seeing a burst from a supernova neutrino is that the neutrinos coming from the supernova actually come in all the six types or flavors of neutrinos. Ryan mentioned this, you've got electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, and also the anti-neutrinos of them. So there's six of them. And those all have, those are all, all, all different. Uh, a supernova will spray all of those flavors around. The detectors here that are existing now, and actually the other ones other than Dune that will exist when Dune turns on, are actually mostly sensitive to only one of these flavors. And I don't know which one, let's say it's the pistachio here. Dune is special because it's, it's sensitive to only, especially sensitive, it's actually sensitive to all of them, but especially sensitive to electron neutrinos, which that's kind of actually, that's the best flavor to be sensitive to. That one actually has some of the most interesting information in it. It's like having the detector that can see the chocolate neutrinos. And it's really, um, there will be a really special um, and especially valuable contribution to uh, seeing that burst of neutrinos around the world. So it would really be, really be valuable. But I just want to say, you know, if this is a rare event, if a supernova happens, it happens only rarely. You want to gather all the information you possibly can from the supernova. And it's the kind of situation where the more detectors that are running, the more information you have, you know, you want all the flavors, you want all the information, and we really want to have a really um, broad and rich worldwide situation for neutrinos. And we have already actually a worldwide network. It's called SNUS, Supernova Early Warning System. And this is another visualization of those same detectors on that other slide. Um, and the idea here is that if, um, because the neutrinos actually come out earlier than the light, they come out earlier by, it could be hours or days. Uh, the, the light actually takes time to get outside of the star. The neutrinos aren't going faster than light, but the, uh, the, the bright photons take some time to, to burst out of the star. You actually have some time to warn astronomers, hey, we saw this burst of neutrinos, you better go, you better go look. And in fact, if you're an amateur astronomer, you can also uh, look for the first light from the star. And so actually snooze, um, here's the website for that. You can uh, even sign up for the mailing list to um, hear, to be among the first to hear about a, a global supernova burst detection. And so this is something that uh, when Dune turns on, Dune will be part of this, um, this worldwide network of supernova neutrino detectors. One last thing that I'm going to mention, uh, some of you may have, may remember that at the very beginning of the year, um, and that seems so very, very long ago now, um, in the before times, there was a period of time when uh, Betelgeuse was dimming and people were saying, you know, Betelgeuse is the star, this is the Orion, which um, you can easily see there's a kind of reddish star on the shoulder of Orion um, called Betelgeuse. It's a famous, it's a relatively close star. Um, and it, it's a red supergiant, and in fact, it could explode. And people were worrying that, oh, it's Betelgeuse is dimming. Does that mean it's about to explode? It turns out it didn't explode. It's actually now pretty much back to normal. Um, but uh, I want to point out that it will blow up probably sometime in the next 100,000 years. Probably not tomorrow, but it could be any time in the next 100,000 years. And if it did, it's close enough that we would see something like 100 million neutrinos, or sorry, 10 million neutrinos. Um, in Dune. So it would be a really enormous blast. And Dune will be ready for this. So this is really, this would be really cool. I want it to not happen now. I want it to happen when Dune is built. <laughs> but uh, um, I hope we'll get, uh, even if we don't get Betelgeuse, we'll get some other explosion. Okay, so let me just end by saying the neutrinos are coming. If you look in the Milky Way, the Milky Way is 650 light centuries across, meaning that the light takes seven, seven, 650 centuries to get to us from the other side. And there's been many core collapses that have happened already and the neutrinos are coming. There are definitely neutrinos that will eventually make it to earth from, from supernovae that have already happened. So I will stop there. All right. Awesome, thank you, Kate, Matt.
Right. Can they hear me, Matt? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kate. I know that you could go on for a long time and explain a lot more about that topic. Um, but we're getting some excellent questions. So keep sending them in and we'll give our speakers the excuse to uh, elaborate a little bit more on these things. Um, but we get to move on to our final speaker of the evening, and that is Dr. Chang Ki Jung. Uh, in the field of particle physics, uh, Dr. Jung, who is a SUNY distinguished professor at Stony Brook University, is one of the world's leading experts on the study of neutrino oscillations. Uh, he is an expert in proton decay as well, which is a hypothetical form of decay in the grand unified, sorry, the grand unification theories in which the proton decays into lighter subatomic particles. Uh, Dr. Jung has participated in the T2K experiment, serving in various leadership positions and joined the leadership team of the Dune experiment during the formative period of the collaboration aimed at deepening the understanding of the physical universe through the study of neutrinos. So tonight he will talk about how Dune could shed light on particle physics beyond the standard model. So welcome. Hello, um, thank you for the invitation. It's a really a pleasure uh, to talking to, to you all. Let me share this, uh, let's see. Can you see the screen? Um, not yet. No? No. You don't see? No. Why is that? Let me. All right, looks like it's working now. Yep. Yep, can see it just fine. And I'm doing in a slide mode. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, with the two excellent uh, talks by uh, uh, Ryan and Kate. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about what else Dune can do. So uh, it will be a little bit more exotic. So let me talk about uh, beyond the star model of particle interactions. Uh, we we like uh, trying to learn from that uh, from Dune. Okay, so this really starts with um, the line of, uh, uh, of thinking in among physicists that, that uh, one of the things what Einstein has worked on in his life and he could not complete is that he asked the question, can all the forces in nature be unified in one form? There are four different types of forces. Uh, there are electricity, um, electromagnetic force, uh, strong interaction, weak interaction and gravitation. In fact, this line of uh, uh, unit trying to unify all particle interaction started with uh, Newton he looked at sky and then uh, apple falling down. He created a, created a gravitation, which is unification. And then uh, there's a thing called the Maxwell equation in the 19th century. Uh, it unified electricity and the magnetism but that is coming from the same origin. So then uh, today we have a thing called a standard model. That is the uh, uni unified electroweak theory, which we developed in the 1960s. And then uh, with a strong interaction, which is put together, it is not an actual unified, but as the theory is put together, uh, these two, we made, uh, we call it standard model particle interactions. So it is not a truly a unified theory. And so a whole, a whole bunch of uh, theorists and uh, physicists are working on try to make even a more unified theory. And that next one is called the grand unification. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, nicely say it cuts. And then those uh, theory will uh, unify electric theory and then the strong interaction. Then finally, uh, with the, uh, some sort of Odesti, we call a theory of everything that is a super string theory. And that can uh, put together a grand unification theory with uh, gravity. So these kind of things that we are working on grand scheme of things 
But to realize this kind of uh, uh, theoretical uh, view of the universe to work, we need experimental uh, evidence. We need experimental inputs to that. So here I describe a little bit of uh, different class of um, uh, physics discoveries. There are many discoveries made, of course, uh, many decades, many centuries, uh, but not, they are uh, different type of uh, discoveries. Uh, this is not often uh, talked about it. So let me say, there are discoveries that is uh, uh, predicted by established theories, for example, CERN model, and then uh, uh, the tau neutrinos and top quark, some of you may have heard about it. Those are the well uh, predicted, and then it had also indirect experimental evidences. But there are some uh, particles like Higgs particle discovery that was predicted, but it was a, such a fundamental implications and also it was very hard to believe that it actually exists. And, and, and that is one of those discoveries. And then there are discoveries that is uh, 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 unproven. Uh, it's predicted by theories, but it's speculative unproven theories. And that was uh, when positron one was uh, discovered, it was one of those cases. And it, actually even neutrino and neutrino oscillation when it was discovered, uh, it was uh, uh, those cases. Uh, today is my topic about the proton decay and, and then other particles and phenomena beyond the standard model uh, in June is uh, in a such kind of cases. Now some more even revolutionary uh, discoveries are the ones that totally unpredicted. This is if you build a detector and then you measure something, you see something totally, totally you haven't thought about and such as, as a blackberry radiation at that uh, usher the era of quantum mechanics uh, or a continuous uh, energy spectrum of beta decay, uh, which was a son in 1920s, 30s, uh, that led Pauli's conjecture of neutrino, uh, existence of neutrino. And then the muon uh, particle was first discovered. Nobody knew what it was. Uh, then, and then that so uh, famously, uh, Ravi Nobel Prize winner said, uh, who ordered that? And then that indicated a second generation lepton, existence of second generation leptons and then that led to a, a third generation. So, uh, so these kind of the different type of uh, discoveries, let me talk about now uh, proton decays and then some other uh, beyond standard model searches. So the first person who talked about, uh, thought about experimental search for uh, proton decays, Maurice Goldhauer, he was in Los Amos 1954. At that time, there was no, uh, Big Bang theory was not yet established. And so people were thinking there is something, uh, universe expands, there's a continuous creation of protons. And say, and then Boris uh, uh, thought about and saying, that, well, protons are continuously created and then you should also decay. So he thought about the proton decay. And then, and then he immediately realized that without doing any experiment, uh, protons must live more than 10 to the 16 years. Uh, uh, that's a very, very long time because uh, his uh, the reasoning was that human body is made out of something like 10 to the 27 uh, protons. If protons decay faster than 10 to 16 years, then we'll be all dead because we, we uh, you know, with the radioactivity will kill us. So that he, he was a very smart person. So he was able to set the proton lifetime greater than 10 to 16 without even doing experiments. Then uh, he worked with a uh, Ryan uh, who had a, a detector that actually discovered the uh, neutrino uh, for the first time. Using that same detector, he was able to set, uh, prove that uh, protons has to live something like 10 to the 21, 10 to 22 years. So here, this is the historic photo of uh, uh, Maurice Goldauer Haber and then uh, Pauli and uh, in 1958. And uh, Maurice Goldhaber, who is sitting here, and this is Pauli. Maurice Goldhaber has just also proved that neutrinos are left-handed. He did a, some ingenious experiment, and uh, he proved that uh, neutrinos are left-handed. So this is a conversation when he went in the BN, uh, Brookhaven. Then uh, Miss Radioactive, I think protons decay. And Pauli said, you cannot be serious. You must be more desperate than I was. Uh, then uh, the Maurice said again, I proved that uh, neutrinos are left-handed as well. And then I heard that, uh, truly amazing. I used to say, I don't believe God is left-handed. So those are some background stories. 
And then uh, there was the king, and after the standard model was established in the 1960s, they were looking in a, in a more uh, a unified theory, and that is a grand unification theory. So first people who talk, talked about was a party salam. This is a party, uh, and then here's a salam. And the party was uh, uh, Salam's great uh, student. So one day, party came and to uh, uh, Salam, saying that Professor Salam, those days, you know, people actually called students called the professor professor. So Professor Salam, my gut feeling is that protons must decay. And and then uh, Salam says, I don't think so. Experimental uh, indication is that otherwise. Let me think about it. And some months later, and he came back and say, oh, my gut feels the same, let's publish it. So they published it. And then uh, two other physicists followed, George I and Galasha. And uh, uh, they came with a, a different type of grand unification theories. But nonetheless, both of these theories were propelled building large underground detector. This is origin of large underground detectors. First one was called IMD. This was built in Cleveland in the US in a big water uh, trunk of detector. And then there's a, a similar one was built in Japan. It's called the Kamiokande detector. And then uh, uh, Fred Juice in the uh, French uh, Italian border in the Alps. And then uh, Sudan detector in, in Minnesota. And then finally, uh, magnificent this uh, super Kamiokande detector, uh, which is in, built in Japan. So this supercarbon candy detector is the one that discovered the neutrino oscillations. And uh, the, as I said earlier, this detector is inspired by grand unification theories for protein candy searches. And it turns out this is also excellent detectors for studying neutrinos because of its large masses. So like prototype time right now, what we know is a 10 to the 34 years you know, you, uh, we're talking about 34 zero. So now, you know, we can't really wait for that. Uh, the, the universe li lifetime is, uh, universe is only uh, something like uh, you know, 13.8 billion years. So this is a much, much larger than the uh, uh, age of universe. So how do we see these things? Because luckily, every particle decays in the nature of exponential decay. So when particles decays, it has a certain lifetime, which is defined when total number is, is reduced to one over E, and uh, that's here, that, that could be 10 to 34 years. We cannot wait for that, but luckily some of them decays very, very early. So we can actually look for particles uh, in one year. If you wanna look for at least one proton decay per year or so, then you need to just build 10 to the 34 uh, proton detector containing that large amount of protons. So this, it requires us to build a huge high uh, detector with a high resolution because when we see any of these uh, proton decays, we want to make sure that it is so. Uh, it is not uh, uh, some other fake uh, or, or background events. So that leads to uh, Dune. Dune far detector is enormous. So you already uh, heard about it. It's a total, uh, the, what we call usable uh, volume is a 40 kiloton. And it's a high resolution that allows us to look at things very, very carefully and then a photographic way. So if proton will decay, this is what will look like in Dune detector. So proton is here and then it decays to K on uh, meson particle and then neutrino comes out, which cannot be detected, it escapes. And then K on will go into the detector and slows down and then it decays to muon and muon neutrinos. And then muon will go uh, here and it stops and decays the electron and then two other neutrinos. And then the, the, this is the positron and the positron is annihilated with the electron in the uh, detector and it generates photons. So it's a beautiful image of uh, proton decay. Once you see it, you are you know, quite sure that this is a proton decay. So if you have several of these events, you will have um, uh, 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 the probed very, very early time in the universe. This is a big bang. And this is like fraction of seconds. So proton decay is the one uh, probes 10 to the 16 GeV, huge amount of high energy at uh, 10 to the minus 30 seconds of the afterbirth of the uh, universe. 
So then uh, let me just briefly say uh, a few words about other beyond the model, sand model physics uh, searches in Dune. And um, the uh, Dune has uh, uh, not, not only huge, big, uh, beautiful uh, far detector, but it has a beautiful near detectors, which has three different technologies here. And then we can use these beautiful state of art uh, uh, detectors and then a powerful uh, neutrino beam we can search for other uh, standard model uh, physics. So first one is that uh, uh, you look for this neutrino oscillation you heard from the previous speaker, and then you see if there's any uh, differences from what we predict from what is actually happening. From this, we can actually see whether there's something called the spherical neutrinos. These spherical neutrinos are the ones, it doesn't interact with anything other than gravity, uh, but it can uh, kind of mix with the uh, other neutrinos. Here it's only electron neutrino, muon, and tau, and then it can uh, manifest a, as a, a, a disappearing and so of uh, some of these neutrinos. So that's what we can look for. Uh, also, many other things. And then, but but this sort of stellar neutrino doesn't need to be one. It could be another one, another one. So these are the kind of things that we uh, look for by studying these neutrino oscillations. Another thing we can do is because we have a beautiful high, a near detector, in a near detector, we can look, look for uh, particles created. They, you know, this is another kind of uh, exotic uh, theory. There's a world of particles that doesn't communicate us, with us at all, but it can communicate through something called the dark photon, which only talks to uh, the light particle photon that we know of. So that those kind of can be created in the beam, uh, in the beam, uh, neutrino beam, uh, the uh, from from the proton target, and then it will manifest in in a new detector. So this is a, one of those things we can look for. Uh, we call it the dark matter, low mass dark matter, and then probing through a dark photon. And finally, we have this beautiful uh, uh, far detector uh, that can look for dark matter is coming from cosmic origin, not coming from the beam. And then uh, there are various uh, things as in particular class of uh, uh, the particles called boosted dark matters. These are the ones, uh, some of the dark matters, very small fraction of dark matters floating around the universe and the internal interactions can create very, very high energy uh, relativistic uh, uh, dark matter particles. And they can come into a detector. It turns out, uh, some of the conventional direct dark matter search detectors are not uh, very good for it. And the new uh, Dune, because of the size and uh, precision, it turns out to be very, very good for detecting these things. So this, uh, uh, with this, uh, Dune will join worldwide dark matter search community with the unique uh, capabilities. So let me uh, finish up. If any of the searches uh, presented in my talk uh, uh, result in a discovery, then it will truly revolutionize the field. Of course, the probability of uh, having such a discovery is low, but it is a uh, high impact to pay off uh, research. With the Dune, we have an exciting journey ahead of us to explore and discover unknown world of particle interactions. Let me just show you uh, one of the video of the Maurice Goldhauer, this is one of my favorite quotes. Here's the Maurice Goldhauer when he was 99 years young, uh, August 1st, 2010. In Poton, may it live forever, but if it dies, let it die in my arms. One more time. In Poton, may it live forever, but if it dies, let it die in my arms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that was terrific. Um, all right, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to go ahead and share their videos and we will bring you all up Let me at stop. once. Um, stop sharing, right? Okay. Yep, there you go. And we will spotlight everyone so that we can see all your faces. Um, thank you all for your talks. We're going to go ahead and transition into a short Q&A ses uh, session. We're going to answer two or three questions. We've been able to feel a lot field a lot of them in the um, Q&A function. So I'm going to pull out just a couple questions for you guys to ask or to answer. 
Um, and one of them, uh, which I think shows how excited people are for this, is from Joshua on Facebook. And he wants to know how long before Dune is built. Um, I know we're, we're still a ways out, but people are excited for this science to happen. Um, who wants to field that one? Ryan. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, so um, as Aaron said at the beginning, we're in the um, uh, sort of pre-excavation and, and civil construction phase. So the construction is happening now, uh, preparing the site for getting all of that rock out from underground and putting the detectors in. The time scale is to construct over uh, this next decade and to try to be operating um, sort of on the time scale of 2026, 2027 in that ballpark. So those are sort of the, the time scales. Obviously, uh, we're projects of this size. Uh, there are uncertainties on the scale of a couple of years, but uh, that, that's you know, it's not tomorrow, and it's it's not ten years from now. Awesome, thank you. So we've got a ways to wait, but there's a lot happening between now and then. Um, here's an interesting question we got. Um, Trillions of neutrinos go through our bodies every second, mainly produced by nuclear reactions in the core of the sun. What is the corresponding number of neutrinos produced at Fermilab that would pass through a person in South Dakota at the uh, site of the Dune experiment? So I don't know if you have made this calculation yet, but does anybody want to take a stab at that question? Me to go look up the beam flux. <laughs> I, I, um, I saw that question in chat, so I, I quickly ran some numbers. Uh, this isn't how many pass through, but this is how many would interact. So as, as, you, as you've heard many times today, neutrinos pass through generally doing nothing. Uh, and so it would take a thousand years of the Fermilab beam passing through you in South Dakota for you to get one interaction. Okay, well, that's an interesting number. To compare with um, Kate's number about the cosmic ray flux, which was, you know, many, many per second. Many per second, yep. Sure. Okay, I think this one will be for Kate. Um, the question is, the idea that some supernova have exploded, but that we just haven't seen them yet is very cool. As time goes on, can we, um, sorry, as time goes on and we can see out into bigger distances, does that mean we should start to see supernova more frequently in the future? Okay, great, great question. So um, the answer is, Basically, yes. So actually, with the neutrino detector, we can really currently only see supernovae that are within our own galaxy, just, and that's really um, just because of, you know, even though it's this gigantic flux in a short period of time, it's, you know, huge numbers of neutrinos in a short period of time, it's still, neutrinos are so weakly interacting that we, we don't, um, you know, you still need a really huge detector to even intersect, uh, you know, even see a thousand of them. Um, you know, that, that's a lot by neutrino standards, but you, uh, you, you know, you need kilotons of detectors to see that. Um, as we get bigger and bigger neutrino detectors, um, then we will be able to see supernovae farther and farther away. And so, for example, the Andromeda galaxy, or when I say see supernovae, I mean with, with neutrinos, actually see some neutrinos from a supernova. The Andromeda galaxy, which is outside of our own galaxy, is, um, we would get like maybe one or two neutrinos from Andromeda if a supernova happened there um, in, in June. As detectors get bigger and bigger, then we can see farther and farther out, but it gets it's still it's still pretty hard just because neutrinos interact so weakly, you know, so few of them will actually interact in a detector. We can see supernovae farther away than our galaxy in photons, and that's just because you don't need, you know, photons are interact a lot. It's easy, easy to see them. Um, and so, yes, it's true. If you can see very far out um, with photons, you, you see a lot more supernovae. You'll see, you know, there's many, many supernovae per month even that are seen in, in photons. And that's because you can see them farther away. So I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Another question we got is, uh, is the argon expensive and how will you transport it all underground? Yeah, it's um, argon as, you know, in small quantities isn't that expensive. It, um, there are a lot of, when you, when you cool down air to get anything out, um, argon is usually 
there along for the ride anyway, if you're trying to get liquid oxygen for something. Um, but, uh, but we're getting 70,000 tons of it. So it ends up being quite expensive. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's transported down um, as a compressed gas and gets uh, compressed into refrigerated and, and recondensed into a liquid when it's underground and then uh, pumped into the detector volumes. And it takes about a year to fill up one, what we call a module, which is one fourth of the total detector. So it'll be several years before you can fill all that up. And that's mostly limited just by how, um, how much you can refrigerate in a given unit of time. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so we had a great analogy of the different flavors of neutrinos with Kate uh, using the ice cream cone and pistachio and chocolate ice cream. Um, this question asks, why do scientists call the name electron neutrino, tau neutrino, muon neutrino? Does it mean that the electron um, and neutrino stick to each other when they detect it? Can you explain a little bit more where they get their names? Uh, can... Yeah, that's that's actually um, that's actually basically right. That's really that is actually kind of what happens. Is that um, in our picture of the fundamental forces of nature, neutrinos interact what, with what's called the weak force. And one of the main ways you can have a weak interaction with a, a you know, that's the only kind of interaction a neutrino will have with matter um, is, is you have a neutrino that will create an electron or a muon or, or a tau when it, when it hits matter. And it's exactly that. It sort of, I guess you could say it sticks, um, that an electron neutrino will make an electron and a muon neutrino will make a muon and a tau neutrino will make a tau. So when that rare interaction actually does happen, you do get an electron or a muon or a tau of the same flavor as the neutrino. So that's, you know, kind of, kind of nailed it there. All right, and we have another question coming in from Facebook and they ask, so can a proton decay into a muon? So I think this one is for Dr. Jung. Yes. They can decay to a proton. Actually, I only talked about proton that decay to kaon, kaon, and then a neutrino. Uh, but there are forty many different decay modes you can decay to. Okay. Uh, we don't we don't have evidence of and none of them, unfortunately. So uh, yes, there are yes you can decay to uh, many different combination of different particles. Okay. Another question is from Bill. He asks, does the Dune experiment need to know whether the source of neutrinos is Fermilab or from an extraterrestrial source? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and we see neutrinos, um, uh, so you heard about seeing them from supernovae. Uh, we can see some from the sun and the ones from Fermilab are um, they have a few uh, uh, sort of signatures that we know they're coming from there. Um, one is that they're, the uh, interactions that, th that they make are pointed in a direction that we can flip and point back to Fermilab. So we can tell the direction that the neutrino came from. And that already gets rid of most environmental backgrounds. Uh, also, the beam isn't on constantly. It's not like a flashlight. Uh, it's, it's pulsed in very, very narrow spikes. So it goes bam and a bunch of neutrinos come and then it's quiet for about a second and then it goes bam and a bunch of neutrinos comes, come. And so any neutrino interactions that you see during those quiet times, which is most of the time, you know couldn't have come from Fermilab. And so those two uh, pieces together get you pretty much um, a completely uh, quiet detector. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, and we got one fairly broad question. So I'm gonna end on this and let you each take a, a stab at it. Um, and this was kind of the, the theme of the night is why is it important to study neutrinos? So I'll let you each kind of respond to that in your own, um, in response or in respect to your own topic that you covered tonight. Why is it important to study neutrinos? And um, Kate, we'll let you go first. Well, um, many, many reasons. Um, 
uh, one of them, which I'm guessing will be the favorite reason of the uh, of uh, the other people here, is that it tells us about fundamental particles. It tells uh, the properties of the fundamental particles and forces, and it tells about the evolution of the universe. But um, relevant to what I was talking about, they can also tell us about astrophysical objects. They can tell us what's going on in the sun, in, in supernovae, in other um, exotic astrophysical sources. So they're really tools for, for studying the universe. All right. And Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, this question could be asked in, in even a broader sense about uh, why, why do we really want to um, pick at all of the open questions that we have about how the universe works, either at the large scales or the small scales or in between. And neutrinos are full of questions. They're, they are so difficult to work with um, that we're learning things about them constantly. And as fundamental research has proven uh, throughout all of human history, we're able to turn that knowledge into usefulness with time. Sometimes it might take 100 years, but uh, I noticed one of the questions in the chat was relating to um, uh, nuclear proliferation monitoring and, and things related to that, and neutrinos play a role there. And so there are already applications of neutrino science um, that are uh, moving from the fundamental research into you know, real world things. From our point of view as, as the scientists studying it, you know, we're driven by the questions themselves, but then the applications roll on as time moves on. Thank you. All right, and Chanky, can you finish this off? Why, why is it important to study neutrinos? Absolutely. So uh, similar to a larger context, I will give you an example. For example, if you are doing astronomy, long time ago, where we start out uh, astronomy, looking at uh, visible light, that's what you can do. And then when we had a, a ability to detect X-rays or radio waves, or infrared, we developed the special tools to study them and they give us different uh, knowledge about the universe that we didn't know, uh, could not access with a visible light. And so what's happening in a particle physics is the neutrino is the, was the one that the known the least and the only recently it has been, uh, uh, we were able to detect them and to study them. So what it does is that it gives us a tool which we didn't have before just like gamma rays and type of things what uh, we use in astronomy for new uh, uh, research. So neutrinos give us very special tool now, modern days, that before we use the electrons and pions and muons and other things. But now we have neutrino, which is a sexy new tool. We can deep into the things like Kate has talked about, supernova inside of stars, which you could not do in, in other ways. And so, so that's why neutrinos are so special. So, and it, it has been very difficult to uh, capture them, first of all, but now we know how to capture them, how to make them. So we use that to probe even deeper part of the uh, knowledge of human knowledge about the universe. And then this is an, uh, you know, on, on, along the same track of all, uh, what we are doing as a, a pure scientist, we essentially want to know more about the universe uh, deeper and deeper using different type of tools. It happened to be today. Neutrino, neutrino is one of the best tools to do so. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, well, that is all the time we have for our Q&A session, but if we didn't get to your question, we will try to gather up those extra stray questions and uh, try to get those answers from you after the event and, and send them out. So um, I wanna thank our fantastic speakers for joining us this evening and helping us understand the enormous potential of the Dune experiment. Um, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to share your, your expertise and your um, enthusiasm for this research. Um, we do have some gifts for you guys, and I want to show you what will be in the mail on your way soon. Um, this is a, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is a photo of the, um, this is the Ross head frame and we're overlooking Kirk Canyon. It is a black and white of us on a winter's day. So this will, remind you guys where your detectors are being built underground here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put that down. You need to move the camera a little bit. Um, so yeah, so that's on your way. 
Um, I also wanna thank our attendees for tuning in and asking some fantastic questions. Um, a recording of this talk will be shared on Facebook, Vimeo, and YouTube. So you can share that with anyone who wasn't able to make it live. Uh, when you leave, you'll be given the option to take a survey about the Deep Talks experience. So please go ahead and um, submit some feedback so that we can continue to be keeping these virtual events interesting and um, applicable to everyone. Um, our next event is on Nobel Day, which is Thursday, December 10th. And we are excited to welcome Nobel laureate Art McDonald whose research with the SNOW experiment helped solve the solar neutrino problem that was created when Ray Davis's 1960s experiment at Homestake Gold Mine, uh, now the location of Sanford Lab, found only one third of the theorized numbers of neutrinos coming from the sun. So we're gonna be talking about neutrinos then as well. Um, Nobel Day will also include a donor recognition event and a presentation of the CORES Award. So please watch for information on that event. We'd love for you to join. So um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, speakers and attendees. We look forward to seeing you guys at Nobel Day. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.